Are you ready, Mr. Lockhart? Think of it as a cleansing of the mind. It's not just about the food. Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained. And as requested, today we'll be exploring Gore Verbinski's 2017 psychological horror film, A Cure for Wellness, starring Dane DeHaan, Mia Goth, and the superb Jason Isaacs. Set in a remote gothic castle, the story centers around a young business executive named Lockhart, who is forced to retrieve his company CEO from a strange rehabilitation facility in the Swiss Alps, known as the Wellness Center, where the elite went to cure whatever ailed them. Though we intended to hastily return to the US with the man, whom the company was hoping to blame for their legal irregularities which threatened to bring them down, a series of events lead to Lockhart being forced to become a patient of the wellness center himself. What begins as a straightforward corporate extraction soon descends into a gothic psychological nightmare for Lockhart, who starts questioning his sanity and well-being due to the strange treatments he's coerced into taking under the direction of the mysterious Dr. Heinrich Vollmer, the institute's director with a gloomy history. Most of my patients have done extraordinary things, built vast fortunes, commanded great empires, but at a terrible cost. Written by Justin Haith, who developed the screenplays for The Clearing and Revolutionary Road, A Cure for Wellness is loosely based on Thomas Mann's formative novel, The Magic Mountain, which itself was based on Mann's experiences when his wife, who was suffering from lung issues, was admitted to a wellness sanatorium in Switzerland. Set a decade before the First World War, the Magic Mountain revolves around a young man named Kastrop visiting his cousin Joachim, who was ill with tuberculosis at a sanatorium in Davos within the Swiss Alps. Though he intended on staying for a few days, Kastrop begins developing a bronchial infection and fever, symptoms synonymous with tuberculosis, leading to his admission into the facility and his extended stay for seven years. During this time, Kastrop is introduced to a myriad of ideologies and worldviews that represented a microcosm of Europe before the First World War. In this way, the narrative unfolds much like a story of formation, with the protagonist leaving his home to take on new learnings and reflections on politics, art, love and human frailty. After recovering from his illness and learning more about the world than he could have ever imagined, Kastrop eventually leaves to fight in the First World War, leaving his fate uncertain for the reader. Given the bleak ending, Mann argues that no amount of collective intelligence would make up for human ignorance and indifference to life, evidence in the large-scale loss of life in the First World War. Verbinski's A Cure for Wellness, on the other hand, is less of an exploration of enlightenment and more of a deconstruction of the over-medicated, hypochondriacal modern life of the bourgeois, with patients arriving at the institute and being happy to accept Volner's diagnosis of imagined physical and psychological ailments despite the strange and radical treatments they're forced to undergo, instead of questioning whether the society they lived in was the real cause of their pain and despair. Opening to a man named Morris working late at night in his office who starts experiencing chest pain and eventually suffers a heart attack after drinking water, the death of the salesman after consuming water foreshadows the dangers our protagonist would face with drinking the contaminated water at the wellness center. This motif is continued in the next scene, which shows Lockhart arriving in his office to find his goldfish had died. However, it's also a window into his obsessive work-driven mind, with the young man prioritizing ambition over life itself. After attending a meeting with the senior executives of his company, Lockhart is blackmailed into recovering Pembroke, the company's CEO who traveled to a spa in the Swiss Alps and had recently sent them a letter stating he intended to stay and never come back. Initially played off as the ramblings of a man that was going through a crisis, we'd soon come to find that something far more sinister was at play. When the young man finally arrives at the wellness center, he's given a glass of water and informed that visiting hours were over, but that an exception would be made for him if he returned in the evening, prompting Lockhart to head over to a hotel and wait it out. But on his way there, his vehicle is struck by a deer, causing the driver to swerve suddenly and crash. While this is happening, Lockhart experiences a flashback to his mother's cremation, indicating that the contaminated water he drank had begun to affect him. He then suddenly snaps back to the present and wakes up in the wellness center with the cast on his foot. Dr. Heinrich Vollmer, who was seated across from him, explains that he had broken his foot in the accident and needed to heal. Much to Lockhart's surprise, he's also informed that Vollmer had contacted his company and told them about the situation, and that they'd uncharacteristically agreed that he should no longer rush to bring himself and the company's CEO back. 
When Volmer leaves, Lockhart drinks another glass of water that was given to him and notices a small parasitic eel floating within it, which tied into the true purpose of the wellness center. After searching the grounds for Pembroke, Lockhart eventually finds him in a spa and asks him to come back, but the old man calmly expresses no interest in returning as he believed he was not well. Pembroke then asks if Lockhart had any relation to a man that used to work for the company named Henry that had taken his life by jumping off a bridge. Though Lockhart states that Henry was his father and begins having a flashback to the day of his death, which he'd witnessed as a boy, he lies and dismisses his feelings by saying that he didn't remember much about it. It's here where Pembroke reveals that Henry's death was caused by the company, which forced him to take the blame for their mistakes, ultimately ruining the lives of his family. This is important to note, as the company is essentially trying to do the exact same thing to Pembroke, and would ultimately pin their mistakes on Lockhart himself should he fail to bring the CEO back. Pembroke then submerges into the water and returns as the ill-mannered and hostile CEO he had been prior to his treatment, indicating that his thoughts and desires were being controlled. While in this state of mind, he acknowledges his responsibilities to the company and agrees to come back. While waiting for Pembroke to pack his things, Lockhart meets Mrs. Watkins, Mr. Hill, and Mr. Nair, who were patients at the center, and the trio inform him that they were benefiting from the therapy. But when he has a private conversation with Watkins, she tells him that over 200 years ago, there had been a crazy baron that was obsessed with protecting his bloodline and had married his sister with the intent of fathering a child with her. After finding out that she was infertile, he began performing experiments on his peasants to cure her, resulting in the discovery of mummified corpses, which in turn led to the locals revolting and burning the Baron and his sister alive. After the Baron's castle had been burnt to the ground, Volmer's predecessors are said to have purchased the land and built the wellness center for medical and rehabilitation usage. Soon after this, the institute began developing a reputation as having the best water treatments in the world, centered around the rumored rejuvenating properties inherent in the mysterious waters of the mountain. Volmer is then said to have refined the process developed by his ancestors and marketed the center into an exclusive spa for the rich that were seeking to rid themselves of unexplained sickness and anxiety. But unbeknownst to the patients at the center and the locals in town, Volmer was actually the Baron, having survived the severe burns to his body in the past and somehow miraculously managed to live for over 200 years. You have the cure? No. <laughs> Actually, I was just leaving. No one ever leaves. Lockhart then meets a young girl called Hannah that lived on the grounds. When asked whether she was also undergoing treatment, she explains that she was a special case that was merely waiting for her father to return. Though Lockhart tells her that he was also not a patient and was on his way back home, he's informed that nobody ever leaves. Unknown to everyone but Volmer and his staff, Hannah was actually his daughter, born from the unholy matrimony of the Baron and his sister. Despite having been cut out of her mother's womb and thrown into the aquifer waters of the mountain to drown by the locals, Hannah, like her father, managed to survive and live for over two centuries as a result of the rejuvenating properties of the mystical waters. Disturbed by the revelation that nobody ever left the wellness center and now unable to find Pembroke, Lockhart confronts Volmer over dinner and asks him where the man was and is told that he had taken a turn for the worst and would not be able to leave for at least a few more days. Frustrated by this, Lockhart accuses Volmer of exploiting his clientele and begins to hallucinate before bleeding from his nose and passing out. Given that Pembroke would not be permitted to leave for at least a few more days, Lockhart heeds Volmer's advice to undergo some of the treatments there and uses a momentary distraction to steal Pembroke's medical records from the doctor's office. Though Lockhart continues to drink the water and go through the spa treatments, instead of getting better, he continues to hallucinate about his past and present. His loss of self and his disconnection from reality is a direct result of the spa treatments and drinking water, which contained tiny parasitic eels that had strange mind-controlling properties on their hosts. These eels, which lived in the aquifer springs below the institute, are seen slithering in the plumbing, bathroom fixtures, and even attack Lockhart while he's in a sensory deprivation tank. While the water found in these springs was toxic for humans, the eels that lived within it had their lifespans increase from roughly 10 years to over 300, and were the key to Volmer's apparent immortality. With no reception on the grounds and no means of communicating with his office, Lockhart trades a small ballerina figure his mother had made for him with Hannah in exchange for a bike ride into town. After buying them a beer in the local bar, Lockhart then heads over to the nearby vet to get Pembroke's medical records translated. While Hannah stayed at the bar listening to music, much to his shock, he discovers that Pembroke and the other patients at the spa suffered from dehydration, despite the water they were consuming. Furthermore, Pembroke and the others had begun to lose their teeth as a result of this, leading to many of the patients wearing fake teeth, a fate that would eventually befall Lockhart himself. 
Hannah then goes to the toilet and is exposed to puberty for the first time during a conversation she has with the local girls about getting a period. Her first dance with the boy immediately follows this and begins triggering feelings that she didn't understand. Although she was technically over 200 years old, the filtered vitamin water she'd been consuming had stunted her growth. Lockhart soon returns to the bar and makes a long distance phone call to his superiors and discovers that they had no idea why he was yet to return, revealing that Volmer had lied to him. He then asks his boss if he was aware of any sickness that Pembroke had, which might have led him to the wellness center and is surprised to learn that the man was in excellent health. When the boy dancing with Hannah starts getting sexually aggressive, Lockhart confronts him and gets attacked. The teenager then brandishes a knife but is stopped in his tracks by Volmer, who enters the bar and takes them both back to the institute. Knowing that Volmer had been lying to him the entire time, Lockhart continues to investigate the wellness center and enters the restricted transfusion wing of the spa, which was actually used for medical experiments. Here, patients like Watkins and Pembroke that were once fine appear to be lifeless, and the staff are shown to be extremely hostile, with one of them seen attacking a patient that woke up in a state of shock and knocking him out before laughing about it. Eventually manipulated into thinking that he was mentally unwell and that he was making up wild theories about Volmer in the Institute, Lockhart begins dissociating from his former self and becomes convinced that he was crazy, so much so that he starts writing the same letter that Pembroke had written to the company, stating that he was unwell and would not be returning home. In a brief moment of clarity, like the one experienced by Pembroke upon their first encounter, Lockhart snaps out of this delusion and cuts his cast open, revealing no injury to his leg. Unfortunately for Lockhart, when he confronts Volmer once again and announces to the patients that the treatments were making them ill, they all start moving towards him in a trance under the control of the eels and begin smothering him. When he wakes up, Lockhart finds himself restrained within a large heated tube. Volmer then appears beside him and explains that no one ever leaves, before stuffing a tube down his throat and releasing the toxic water from the springs and several eels that begin entering his stomach. This process was the key to the vitamin water Volma, Hannah, and the staff at the center had been consuming, which gave them a form of immortality. After dissecting the eels, the mad scientists had discovered that the waters extended the lifespans of the creatures, but because they were toxic for humans, as seen with the withered remains of the patients that consumed it, he developed a unique filtration system. This method involved patients consuming the toxic water and having eels pumped into their stomachs, the patients would then be put into heat chambers and the byproduct of the chemical reactions between the eels and the water within their bodies would drop out of the chambers in the form of sweat. It's for this reason that when Lockhart tries Hannah's vitamins, he comments on how it tasted like sweaty fish. Having learned from his earlier mistakes, instead of using unwilling subjects, the Baron created the Wellness Center to take advantage of the existential angst that industry titans like Pembroke had, and use it to create a human vitamin factory. Volmer would then feed the patients who ultimately died of dehydration to the eels, eradicating any evidence of his wrongdoing. Though Volmer desired to become immortal, his ultimate plan was to father a purebred race of what he considered to be genetically superior humans by marrying and bedding his daughter, as he had done with his sister centuries before. But because she had not yet developed into a woman, the mad scientist was essentially waiting for this moment. Despite having almost lost his mind to the eels, Lockhart is once again able to snap back to reality, this time with the help of Hannah, who gives him back the ballerina figure to remind him of who he was. Hannah also has her first period, prompting Volmer and his staff to host a creepy ceremony with the end goal of consummation. But just as Volmer is about to force himself on her, Lockhart arrives and confronts him. During their ensuing struggle, Volmer has his face ripped off, revealing his monstrous form, altered by years of youth-preserving vitamin consumption. Lockhart then sets Volmer alight, causing the underground chamber and the entire center to burst into flames, before Hannah appeared behind her father and hit him over the head with a shovel, killing him in the process. While the staff of the wellness center cry in shock and attempt to put the fires out, Lockhart and Hannah ride away from the institute only to be hit by a car containing Lockhart's superiors. Despite their insistence for him to come with them, Lockhart ignores them and continues riding off with Hannah sporting a maniacal smile on his face. Up until his arrival at the wellness center, Lockhart was consumed by ambition and success, unlike no one else his age. He was so driven by this obsession that he was willing to throw Pembroke under the bus, much in the same way that the company had discarded his father. Is that why you came all this way? Ambition? Then you have it worse than any of us. His smile at the end is a triumphant sign that he'd not only defeated the sinister Volmer, liberated all the patients, and avenged his father by allowing the company to collapse, but was also an indication that for the first time in his life, he felt genuine peace and freedom. 
What Lockhart realizes at the end is what I'd suggested at the start of the video, that the reason for his sickness was his environment, and only after vacating this toxic lifestyle was he able to attain inner peace. So, if you're a neurotic, angsty titan of industry who's told to go to an idyllic spa retreat in the mountains by a physician, A. Don't go. Instead, distance yourself from harmful environments, and B. Or maybe it's time for a second opinion. Well, that's all for today, folks. A huge thanks to everyone who requested we explore a cure for wellness. Don't forget to hit subscribe and click the notification icon to stay up to date on all my content. And if there's anything else you'd like to request, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film and Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by. This place is making you sick. It's in the water. You're dying and you can't even see it. But I'm here for the cure. There is no cure! What are you doing?